Okay, and I'm going to start. That's wonderful. All right, I can see that Look. people are logging on and joining us right now. We'll give it a few minutes till everybody is here. And we will give it another two minutes till everybody we meet here is uh, fully back on. Still see people joining, that is great. Maybe one more minute. I still see people logging on. We give it another minute or so. I see that we need to have somebody rejoin here as well. Okay, so I'm reading in the chat box that we need to uh, uh, call for everybody's patience. Just one more minute till we have everybody safely logged on to the session. And while we're doing this, so, uh, all right, I guess uh, almost all the participants that I can see here have logged on and with this, with no further delay, Welcome to this year's uh, Great Decision Speaker Series. This is the first event of our 2022 uh, Great Decision Speaker Series, which is an initiative of the Foreign Policy Association, sponsored locally by the World Affairs Council and the St. Louis Chapter, and AMSOL Global, which is the International Office of the University of Missouri, St. Louis. My name is Liana Konstantin. I'm the executive director of the UMSO Global Office. And UMSO Global has been a partner and sponsor of the speaker series for many years. So it's my great pleasure to welcome everybody here today. Uh, I can see people are still logging on. Um, but uh, a few remarks maybe on the tradition of, uh, of the speaker series. As I mentioned earlier, Great Decisions is an initiative of the Foreign Policy Association. The first Great Decisions group was launched actually in Portland, Oregon as early as 1954. And it was based on a face-to-face -face model, something we all miss uh, these days um, while we're uh, utilizing Zoom. But it was, missed on a, uh, it was based on a face-to-face uh, -face model facilitating active and informal conversation. Meanwhile, Great Decisions has developed into the largest US-based discussion program about foreign policy providing an opportunity for US audiences and sometimes also beyond that to learn about and understand the complex foreign policy issues of our time and to understand the essential of a democratic society. As many of our frequent followers, followers know, the World Affairs Council is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization with local chapters across the United States. 
We are a membership-based organization that connects each local chapter with the world. Founded in 1948, its mission uh, is to offer programs which promote understanding, engagement, relationship, and leadership of world affairs. Here in the, in the St. Louis metropolitan area, and in the state of Missouri itself, I personally believe we have reason to be proud of our continuous engagement in this space due to, this, uh, to the active, creative, and ambitious membership base that we have alongside our uh, impressive volunteer leaders promoting this event, uh, this type of events um, and several others across the uh, World Affairs Council's activities. As we all know though, uh, there remains much to do for all of us to nurture world understanding in all spaces of life. And before I turn it over to my colleague Bob L here, uh, here's some technical information for your setup today. You have already heard this uh, webinar is being recorded. So, um, but you will be able to submit your questions in the Q&A button uh, on the bottom of the screen that you find there below, and you can submit your questions at any point of time during this presentation. So, and without any further delay, I'd like to hand it over to my colleague, Bob L for introductions of the speaker. Hello, good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. My name is Bob L, and I am the Senior International Program Coordinator here at UMSL Global. It is my great pleasure and delight to introduce today's speaker to you. He's a fascinating individual I've had the pleasure of knowing for many years and someone I'm proud to call a friend. Many people talk about challenging their organizations to take moonshots. Our next speaker has led several of these to the actual moon. Greg Marinak is the co-founder, secretary, and director of the XPRIZE Foundation. The $10 million Ansari XPRIZE ignited the modern commercial space flight revolution that is booming today. He was the CEO of the Space Studies Institute of Princeton, senior scientist of the Futron Corporation, and served on the Director's Council of the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. He received the Space Frontier Foundation's Vision to Reality Award for starting the Lunar Prospector team that found ice at the poles of the moon, and he received Russia's Silkovsky Medal for his work on the use of the energy and material resources of free space. Greg is a commercial pilot and flight instructor who has been flying for more than 40 years, and he chairs the energy and space tracks at Singularity University. And he is the only person I know with a moon base named after him in a science fiction story. Please welcome Greg Marinak. Greg? Greetings. Hello, Bob. Thank you for that nice introduction. Hi. How are you today? Doing great. How are you? in snowy St. Louis, where we have about a third of a meter of snow on the ground. Yes. So, uh, are you able to turn your camera on? There yeah, we let's see, we're having... Um... There we go. There we go. Perfect. Yeah, I'm getting some uh, power fluctuations out here in exurban St. Louis at the moment, so... Oh, okay. Uh, I'll, I'll warn you that uh, if we had a disruption, I'll I will do my best to get us right back on instantly, and and apologize in advance to the group assembled. So we are in an amazing time right now, where a, a revolution that started about forty years ago, right in the post Apollo time, has uh, is coming to fruition, it, uh, and yet what people talk about in space and know about in space is actually based on, on 60, 70 year old visions of what we might do in space or even older, even 100, 100 years ago before humans had any capability close to getting into space. So when you talk about making good decisions about space or making good decisions for society, knowing uh, what's really possible and these revolutionary, exciting things that are happening right now in the real world is absolutely essential. So I look forward to talking about these different models, changing the models that, that uh, I know from experience, probably all, most or all of you have in your heads about space. 
So let's see if we can screen share in a more efficient way here. There we go. So if by disrupting those old models uh, about space, I want to talk about how we can achieve relatively unlimited abundance and hope uh, for the future of humanity and getting us through, especially the difficult times that we face in the next 50 to 100 years or so. The model that is still persistent uh, in the world today is that what you do in space is you travel through evil, bad, ugly space to get to those beautiful other Earths, places like Mars and Venus. Of course, we've learned since we achieved space travel that Mars is hell and Venus is hell cubed. So why is it that we still pers persist in some of these old models? Uh, the famous uh, scientist Max Planck had a great saying. He said, science progresses one funeral at a time. Uh, that's kind of a dark way of saying that ideas have persistence. They're sort of, they have inertia and, and they stick in people's heads. So let's look at a uh, unconstrained vision of what we can do with space. The most important myth to overcome is what I call the planetary myth. It's the myth that the only fit places for humanity in the future are the surface of other planets as we move out into the cosmos. Uh, and that was based on beliefs that people had 100 plus years ago when they thought about travel as being sort of like travel on Earth, where going from one place on Earth to any other place on Earth is sort of the same, it, 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 proportional to the distance, and you know, maybe ocean travel is easier than land travel. but Basically, everything's kind of the same, but that's not true in space at all. So this is a, a 1940s depiction by Arthur Clarke of, of uh, the energy cost that it takes to get from the surface of the earth out onto what I call the plateau of free space. Once you get out into space, it, it's quite easy to move around and relatively uh, takes relatively little energy, it's relatively low cost once you're up there. But getting there, in the case of the Earth, requires expending as much energy as if you had to lift a weight from the surface, uh, well, lift the weight straight up 4,000 miles. So this is called the gravity well model. And it, it basically says, think about the planets as being situated at the bottom of deep gravity wells uh, on the plateau of free space. And the bigger the planet, the deeper the well. Let me show you a little uh, animation that we made at the St. Louis Science Center uh, that shows this in motion. To understand why the moon is so important to the Earth and to the exploration of space, Let's consider a new way to view the solar system. We'll turn the solar system on its side and imagine that it is a giant tabletop. Objects on the tabletop are in free space, and it takes very little energy to move around once there. Wells in that table show the energy needed to get into space from the sun, the planets, and other bodies. The more massive the object, the deeper the well. It takes enormous amounts of energy to climb up out of the deep planetary gravity wells to get to the plateau of free space. But although we Earthlings are gravitationally disadvantaged at the bottom of the deepest planetary gravity well in the inner solar system, we live right next to a more practical source of space materials, the moon. In contrast to the Earth's deep gravity well, the moon's in a gravity dimple. If the Earth's gravity well is 22 steps deep, the moon's gravity dimple is only one small step deep. Most of the cost and danger of spaceflight comes from the difficulty of crawling up out of the Earth's deep gravity well. Instead of using Earth materials for construction in space, we can build space stations, power satellites, or spaceships using raw materials launched over the curve of the moon's gravity dimple 
and let these lunar materials roll downhill to high orbit around the Earth. So if we can find locations in space that are already in space for materials, we can do amazing projects that would be physically and economically impossible if we had to get all the parts from the surface of the earth from the bottom of our deep gravity well. And let me show you this to you in, a, in another way. On the left here, we have a, a Gemini space capsule uh, and those capsules were built just a few miles across the street from uh, the University of Missouri, St. Louis campus at Lambert Field. And to put that capsule and two astronauts in their long underwear in Earth orbit, took that huge rocket, a Titan missile, even sounds big, Titan, yeah. Uh, but to take two astronauts off the surface of the moon with 100 pounds of rocks, took only the top half of the lunar module that you see there, the, the ascent part, is that little bit on the top. So that very graphically illustrates the difference in getting materials into uh, onto the plateau of free space from the moon versus the earth. Well, if free space is so good, why has this old model of doing things on the surface of planets uh, been so pervasive? Um, the great science and science fiction writer Isaac Asimov referred to people that that believe that humans could only do things on planets as planetary chauvinists, which I think is a pretty apt description. But it's sort of the model for doing everything in space today for most of the people in the world and many of the space agencies of the world. Well, how did that come to be? Well, it's a great story. It turns out it came in part because of a translation error. Uh, the great Italian uh, astronomer Schiaparelli wrote in a letter uh, with great excitement that he wrote to, to uh, Percival Lowell, an American astronomer, very famous. He was probably as famous in his day as um, Neil deGrasse Tyson is today as a, a popularizer of science. And with his telescope, he could see patterns changing on the surface of Mars. And he wrote in Italian, I see channels. And channels in Italian is canelli. Well, Lowell's American translator translated channels into canals. And Percival Lowell was inflamed by the uh, uh, belief that there was intelligent life on the surface of Mars that was doing planetary scale engineering. Uh, and was clearly intelligent. And in fact, this is from the a 1906 uh, New York Times paper now, Professor Perfe uh, Percival Lowell, the greatest authority in the subject, declares there can be no doubt that living beings inhabit our neighbor world. So this very romantic belief that uh, the planet that happens to be closest to us in the solar system most of the time uh, was inhabited by intelligent beings comes into, into view. And a British writer uh, starts thinking about what does that mean? And he thought, gee, if you had intelligent life on Mars and they're capable of, of such technological things as planetary scale engineering, might they not just look around for a better place to go instead of trying to uh, uh, eke out a survival existence on their dying planet? And he wrote a book about it and it was called The War of the Worlds. And it was the, the second wave of science fiction. The first big popular wave was Jules Verne. Uh, Greg, your audio is uh, cutting out. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you, Bob. Uh, Wells' uh, very graphic novels, uh, I mean graphic in terms of his imaginary scope, uh, further cemented the, the notion that Mars is a thing to do in space. And then in, in my lifetime, uh, or just a little before my lifetime and before the lifetime of most of you on this call, probably in the 50s, 1950s, Werner von Braun writes a book called Das Mars Project, which was looking at, at ways to get uh, lots and lots of people to Mars. 
And he teamed up with the marvelous illustrator Chesley Bonestell to create beautiful paintings like the ones you see here on the cover of Collier's Magazine. It was an extremely popular thing. Collier's was, was one of the biggest uh, magazines of the era. And it caught the attention of Walt Disney, who was starting to promote Disneyland with a brand new TV show on Sunday nights, which was called Disneyland originally. And the show he did with Werner von Braun about this vision of going out to Mars was one of the most popular uh, television shows of the 50s. And it, it, uh, it became very ingrained in American popular culture that this is what you do. And von Braun's colleagues at the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama, who were the designers of the Saturn rocket, uh, they were basically the propulsion leads for NASA, they put together a sort of a engineering dream about how we might go out and do von Braun's goal of getting lots of people to Mars. And about the time that Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin were walking on the moon, uh, Vice President Spiro Agnew and his committee on what to do in space had adopted von Braun's plan. And there was only one problem with it. The problem was there's no reason to do this. There's no scientific uh, uh, political rationale or economic rationale to do it. It was just sort of an engineering dream of what you might do. And the US Congress took one look at it and the cost and said, no way. And uh, NASA was shocked because they'd never been told no by the Congress. They, NASA, which was created in the late 1950s, post Sputnik, uh, had always gotten everything it wanted and more from the body politic up to uh, you know a significant percentage, like three, four percent of the U.S. GDP at the peak of the Apollo spending. So this was a shock to them, and. NASA's response to being told no was to come back a year later with the exact same plan. And this time they were told, hell no. And uh, you'd think that maybe NASA would have gone to a different plan, but instead what they did was they started to cherry pick pieces of this dream. And if I tell you the names of some of the first components of, of the, the uh, Marshall study from the mid 1960s, you will, have heard them because the, the first couple pieces were called space shuttle, space station. Now the space shuttle and space station that actually came to pass are not the same ones that were in this plan, but um, uh, this still remains sort of the psychological baseline for a lot of people in the world, including at NASA, but it's changing. And it changed because of people like this man. This is Gerard O'Neill of Princeton. And he was a brilliant experimental physicist responsible for um, uh, something called colliding beam storage rings, which are a feature of all the big atom smashers around the world at places like CERN and Fermilab. Uh, and he liked to challenge his students at Princeton with interesting physics, related problems. And he asked his students, he challenged them to say, what's the best place uh, for an expanding technological civilization? Is it, is it the earth? Is it, is it the surface of the moon or Mars? A, a different planet or somewhere else entirely? And the answer came back surprisingly, somewhere else entirely, because O'Neill and his students understood the possibilities of operating in free space rather than on planets. So we're going to take a look with the rest of our time today at what are the useful places in our solar system that are in free space as opposed to down at the bottom of deep, dark gravity wells. And of course, we've talked about one already, the moon. And we've been there. 12 humans have walked on the moon. As a result, we know a lot about the composition of the materials there. We had what we did not find in great quantities was any any form of water. Actually, there was some water in the lunar samples, but it was believed to be contamination. Turns out it was actually there. But uh, some of us had the dream that maybe we would see something like this picture under the pie chart, ice at the poles of the moon. And why might there be ice there? 
because the moon's axis of rotation is only tilted about a degree and a half. The Earth's is tilted about 23 and a half degrees. So that's why we have polar, uh, well, we have winters and summers, basically. Uh, the moon never gets polar summers. So there are places at the North and South Pole of the moon that have not seen any sunlight for billions of years. And it was hoped that maybe there'd be frozen volatiles there. And it turns out and that there is water there. And that fact, in fact, the whole solar system seems to have water every place we look. What we had thought up until quite recently was a very dry location. It's not dry at all. And I had the, the uh, opportunity to be part of that. And we started at the Space Studies Institute, a private space probe called Lunar Prospector. Uh, and we designed it and built a mock-up of it. And I'm the, I'm the guy in the middle with the funny looking light blue suit there, flanked by our chief scientist, Alan Binder, and Jim Burke from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory of Song and Legend. And our idea was to send a very simple, very cheap space probe that would cost maybe $50 million as opposed to a billion dollars that, that were some of the NASA designs, mainly to look for water and, and do a few other very simple things. Well, we couldn't get the money to build the spacecraft. We even had a launch lined up for this thing, but, uh, but then NASA decided to open up something called the discovery class missions to universities and other groups that had outside ideas of what to do. And Alan Binder, who you see on the left there, was relentless and he succeeded in getting NASA funding to actually fly Prospector. And this is what it looked like when it was actually built for space. And it was launched in uh, January of 1998 and it found millions of tons of hydrogen in ice at the North and South Poles of the moon. Now, the reason we're interested in using lunar materials is not so much for doing things on the surface of the moon, but rather for using them as feedstocks for doing things in space. And, and it's because of that energy difference, the fact that it's easy to move things around out of the little gravity dimple of the moon, and we can do things with that in space. So uh, those resources are energy, uh, they're, they're energetically close to where we wanna do things. But it's also useful to have resources that are physically close because, in, especially in the case of the moon, you can actually operate equipment on the moon's surface or in the vicinity of the moon from the Earth without having to physically go there. So let's talk about the Earth-Moon system so that we know our neighborhood in space. And you probably have two things at home that are this exact scale of the Earth and the moon. If you have a basketball and a tennis ball, they're almost exactly uh, the right size to scale with respect to each other. But how far apart are they? And since we're not together in person, I won't pull out a basketball and tennis ball, but I'd like you to imagine one. And I challenge you to think for a moment, how far apart do you have to hold those two objects to have them at the real scale of the earth moon system? That's a little bit of a trick way of asking it because you can't hold them in your arms that close. It turns out, the distance of the moon from the earth is 30 earth diameters. So with your basketball, you need 30 diameter distance. Here's a little sketch up drawing of what that is. It's about 27 feet at that scale. The important thing is it takes light about 1.35 seconds to go that distance. And NASA believed that humans could not control equipment in real time through that round trip 2.7 uh, second time delay. So my colleagues and I went to Radio Shack and bought a bunch of toy robots. You can see some of them here. And we built some fairly sophisticated for the day um, time delay boxes, which gave us the, the actual time delay. And what we discovered was adult humans become totally competent at operating at that 2.7 second delay in about 10 minutes. And five, year, five and 10 year old children uh, pick it up in about 35 seconds. Just incredible. So it's handy to have uh, those resources close at hand. So what are we going to do with resources in space that we don't have to launch from the surface of the Earth at great expense? Well, 
one of the things that we really need to do right now is we need sources of carbon free energy, especially for cities and mega cities where the energy density requirements are very high and for industry too. So we love to use solar energy, but the problem with solar energy is the earth itself gets in the way half the time. Uh, we have night and, and day cycles. And it was proposed back in the 1960s that we might someday build stations in space where the sun shines all the time. If you go about three diameters, three earth diameters away from earth, uh, that's the altitude of geostationary orbit. It's sunny up there all the time and you can send power down in the form of a radio beam to the earth. And during uh, the oil embargo period of the mid 1970s, NASA and the Department of Energy studied how to do this in amazing detail. And they wanted to build these large satellites by launching stuff from the surface of the earth, but it would be much cheaper to build them if, uh, from material from places say like the moon. And you could build more than 99% of the mass of those satellites from lunar material. So here's a cartoon of, of, of a system on the moon that's just a, a scraper basically. When people think about mining, they think about really complicated stuff. This is about as complicated as the simplest gravel pit you'll find any place on Earth. In fact, the same techniques are used in, in are underwater. And scooped soil from the moon is compressed into baseball sized uh, pellets. And they can be launched without rockets. Rockets are an expensive way to. Um, change energy into mo uh, like electrical power or heat energy into kinetic energy of motion. But electromagnetic motors are extremely efficient. They're like 99% efficient. So this shows a, a NASA painting of an electromagnetic launch system called the mass driver on the moon. And these machines were actually built at, at MIT and at Princeton. And we got the length of the required launch system down from five miles to 500 feet. We went from about 30 gravities acceleration to about 1800 gravities acceleration. So here's a cartoon of the, the overall flow. You have a, a catapult on the moon that throws baseballs of lunar soil out of the moon's little gravity dimple. And you catch them at a location in the earth moon system called L2. And once they're on the plateau of free space, you can move them slowly and cheaply to wherever you take that material apart using solar energy to manufacture products like solar power satellites. And in fact, this shows a test that was done in 1975 out in the Mojave Desert using one of the deep space tracking antennas, not as a receiver or transmitter for satellites, but to send an energy beam Well, I think Greg might have uh, had a bit of a power fluctuation, just like we were afraid of. So let's give him a couple minutes here to see if uh, see if we can fix this situation, which I'm sure we can. But just bear with us, folks. As uh, as most of you who I assume are in the St. Louis area are aware, we've got some pretty uh, bad winter weather and uh and i've been to greg's house it's kind of out in the uh more rural area and uh <laughs> i wouldn't be surprised if if they might be having power issues out there with the snow we're getting so um so yeah just be patient with us uh if you have any uh i do see some questions coming in some good questions um so hopefully we can get greg back here in just a couple minutes um, I know he would be thrilled to see your questions and to answer them. So anyway, just, uh, just hang tight for a bit and we will be back with you as soon as we can. Liana, do you have anything to add? 
So no. that's good. We have fingers crossed here. So uh, we actually had good prep sessions, but with the weather here, I don't know where everybody is from today. I saw a lot of our um, our traditional uh, participants from St. Louis were saying hi to everybody and thanks for logging on. And as Bob said, just hang in there and I'm sure that Greg will um, try to be back on in, in just a minute. And I downloaded this backdrop specifically for this event, but uh, honestly, um, you know, it's, it, it, it might be a little more accurate to, to use this one uh, with, <laughs> the kind of uh, conditions we have out there today. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's a little bit chilly out there. So uh, we, do have, uh, we do have more events in this series coming up. Um, next, uh, I guess in two weeks from today, we have, uh, let's see, it is a- uh, Dr. Tom Hare. Drug yes, thank you, Lorna, Dr. Tom America. Hare. He will be speaking about drug policy in Latin America, U.S. drug policy as it relates to, to Latin America, correct? Um, and he is from uh, Notre Dame University, or University of Notre Dame. And um, does anyone have any questions about uh, UMSL Global or um, World Affairs Council of St. Louis? We'd be happy to answer those as well. So as we are waiting also, uh, to give you, for everybody who is new to the speaker series here, what has always amazed me and some of our AMSL uh, members of the speaker series is, you know, the set of events that we have here in St. Louis is in concurrence with uh, all the other World Affairs um, uh, Council chapters in every single uh, city where they have World Affairs Council. So basically, the topic that you see covered here today uh, it will be covered also in Chicago, in Atlanta, in all, the, uh, in all those places, maybe with different speakers. Sometimes uh, those events are, ever since we moved to, uh, to Zoom, those are coordinated. We sometimes share speakers now that we are all online. But uh, basically, the, uh, the main topics are pre-selected by um, the uh, uh, Foreign Affairs um, uh, Council, and uh, we are anxiously waiting for them, right, Lorna? Like every, um, every single year, we're waiting, what are the topics, who can we find? Um, and um, that is, um, for me, it's really great to know that um, the, uh, what topics will be picked, and um, uh, who we might uh, be able to invite as our speakers. So maybe, do we have any questions on the World Affairs Council? Not yet, um, don't see any, I'd say hang in tight. Bob, did you wanna say something else? Well, we do have a question from Jack Bader. He asked if uh, we could share with uh, the audience some of our favorite space jokes. So, um, what do you get in an outer space talent competition? Anyone? It's a constellation prize. Yeah. Anyway, I just, uh, um, oh, and a dentist. Uh, <laughs> let's see. We have one from uh, Lorna. Uh, a couple of them from Lorna, uh, our friend Lorna Curdy, who, who never gets on camera. She, she asked, what was the first animal in space? It was the cow that jumped over the moon. And what does a dentist call an astronaut's cavity? That would be a black hole. Um, let's see here. All right. Let's, we could, we could also um, give Greg maybe let's say five minutes. And then mm -hmm. if he isn't able to join in that time, uh, we can reschedule uh, uh, yeah, this. we can definitely yeah. do that. Yeah. Uh, now I did, I also just spoke with Greg on the phone. That's why I muted myself a little bit ago. Um, they are having a power outage, but he is, uh, he thinks it might just be a breaker or something in his house. He thinks he might have power in another part of his house, but, um, he's working on it and he hopes to be back very soon. So, uh, there is a question here about World Affairs Council of St. Louis. So 
uh, Phil asks, if someone would like to volunteer and or work in world affairs from a base here in St. Louis, do you have any recommendations? So anyone, Lorna? Well, you definitely can come volunteer for us. Um, you know, it's kind of strange doing everything um, virtually right now because it, it makes for volunteering kind of a bit trickier and more complicated. But um, I'm sure Jonathan Gutierrez, who has been interning with us for three semesters now, um, would put our volunteer link to our website in the chat. I think um, he could probably do that. And you could reach out to us and we would be happy to see what we could figure out to help you volunteer for our organization. Um, in terms of working in world affairs, um, I think I think UMSL Global might have some uh, new job postings that uh, is true. happening that maybe Liana could uh, find a quick link to. There's a number of job postings in the UMSL Global. If you want to talk about some jobs, Liana, in, at UMSL Global right now. I can. Um, we have three job openings right now, but we are already interviewing. So if uh, somebody really, really quick, so we have one for in, in international enrollment, and then we have another opening uh, for um, what we call an internationalization strategist and senior recruiter. And then we have a third one for uh, international student events. It's an uh, event coordinator. Um, who um, would join our team, our sub-team that is called International Students and Scholar Services. All those should be on our website right now. But as I said, be quick uh, because we have a pool of applicants we're interviewing right now. Um, yep, and we're looking forward to uh, regrowing the team. Absolutely. You would get to work with us. We're fun. We're a lot of fun in person, I guarantee it. Uh, Susan, Susan Williams asked a question. Will you be showing the videos after the talks? So um, we, in, in years past, there have been uh, some, uh, the Foreign Policy Association has released videos. Hey, Greg's back. Hi, Greg. Welcome well, back. Hello, hello, patient viewers. I'm sorry, uh, I'm on auxiliary power now. Uh, the uh, the feared power outage due to this ice and snowstorm apparently took out uh, my system, but I'm back up. And how ironic that as I'm talking about how to how to transmit energy around, it happens. So permit me to uh, jump back in. It's fine. We told space jokes while you were gone. Yes. Oh, excellent. We knew is what you would have wanted. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am of Polish descent, and I would, you know, people would say, "Why, uh, why, you know, what attracts you to this?" I said, "Well, why, why do Polish kids make the best astronauts?" And they would say, "Why?" I say, "Because we were told we took all our time in school taking up space." So, pretty bad. But uh, let's see. Let's see if you're seeing. Are you seeing full screen? Not yet. Mom, let me no. turn off my camera and mic. I'll let you have the floor again. All right. I may need to do something that, as well. Are you getting screen sharing, Bob? Advise. Not yet. Okay. Greg, just making sure you use the same link that you used for your first yes, logon. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay, this might. There we go. Perfect. Almost there. Okay. Almost there. Just got to move to the slideshow now. 
Oh, there we go. The lamps were red. So <clears throat> let me um, let me explain what's going on here. This this big dish in the front is sending a radio frequency beam to a a set of panels. Each panel is connected to one of these floodlights, and half the energy was thrown away, and the, the other half that was used to light up these uh, these lights that you'll see here. So let me just show you a little uh, uh, 40 second video from that day in June of 1975. Of the calibrated RF power flux density, that fell on the 24 square meter rectana array on June 5th, 1975, 82.5% was collected and converted to direct current output. So it, 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 it surprises almost everybody who's not involved in the field that wireless power transmission has been demonstrated at multi kilowatt scale, hundreds of kilowatts. Uh, but those big solar power satellites uh, that can send five gigawatts, five billion watts of power, that's about uh, tip about five times the typical size of a, of a nuclear reactor or a, or a good sized power dam. Uh, uh, those would be large artifacts to start off with. There is an interesting market for beamed power that relates to aviation. Aviation is the hardest human activity to decarbonize. You know, it's not too hard to take cars and, and put batteries at them. I know some of you in the audience have electric cars already, uh, but air, airplanes are an awful lot of, uh, are very difficult to, uh, to power because the energy density requirements for aircraft is high and the weight limitations are pretty severe. But what if you could transmit energy to an aircraft in flight and in fact, there have been designs for doing that with airplanes uh, for some years. And what you're doing in, in the, the case of that is you're replacing the kerosene, whose only job in, an air, in a turbojet engine is to heat air up with externally provided energy. So that's what you see here on the left side. And you could have a satellite that would be a thousand times smaller in energy collection area and also quite a few times smaller because instead of a a uh, fairly diffuse radio beam that you could probably use a laser to send the energy down. And there's been some work in the US and, and elsewhere on vehicles, very small vehicles that could enable you to go not with 100 or 200 other of your closest friends across the Atlantic Ocean, but just you and one or two other people from one side of the earth to the other in 50 minutes. And these are called light craft. And if you go online, you can see some technical demonstrations on YouTube of, of um, and in fact, in the bibliography, there's some links where you can see uh, uh, baseball sized light craft models flown in the United States at uh, White Sands Missile Ranch. Well, besides solving the Earth's energy problem and combating climate change, what else could you do once you have a source of materials in free space? Well, one of the things that really has caught people's imagination is the idea of building large habitats in free space from the material that's already there. And these would be much larger than what you could afford to build with launching materials from the surface of the earth. And sometimes people call these space colonies. And Professor O'Neill uh, wrote about these in September of 1974. And as a sort of existence proof, he looked at how big could you build a habitat that could rotate to provide artificial gravity at 1G, the level that, that uh, we're used to having. Uh, how big could you build them if you limited yourself to very simple material science, like what was used to build the Brooklyn Bridge, steel cables and, and concrete or stone type work? And the answer turns out you could build enormous things uh, big enough to have the surface land equivalent of Switzerland using those primitive technologies of, of steel cables and, uh, and glass and, and concrete. 
So this is a NASA painting of the interior of one of those habitats with three land areas and three window areas. And it's amazing to think about what could be once you are freed from the limitations of having to launch the supplies, the construction materials from the earth. But of course we wouldn't start at that gigantic scale. And in fact, O'Neill spent the, the rest of his life uh, working on how small and how soon could we build uh, these kinds of space habitats, true space habitats that were really self-contained and provided radiation shielding, close cycle life support and, and gravity. And we, to this day, we don't know how much gravity it takes for people to really survive for long periods of time in space. We, we've not done the experiments to find out. Uh, it's one of the most pressing issues really in, in space flight today. I'm gonna pop ahead a little bit apart from the pretty views because it's recently occurred to me that what a space habitat is, is the functional equivalent of a biological cell. And I encourage you to take a look at a book that came out last year uh, by uh, uh, Dr. Paul Nurse. He won the uh, Nobel Prize. Uh, it's about the five great ideas in biology. And Nurse points out that this, even the simplest early cells were what really made it possible for life to emerge on the earth under what were really difficult, we would characterize it today as hellish conditions. But because of the cell wall, the cell membrane, which is just a few molecules thick, you could have chemical processes insulated from the, the, the challenging outside environment to enable life to flourish. And that's really what a, a space habitat does. It's mostly empty. It's, it's mostly about the equivalent of the cell membranes, the, the vessel itself. So besides the moon, where else can we get goodies for humanity to expand into space and live any place where there's energy and material to work with? So here's our little sketch of, uh, uh, this is a, a Google, old Google SketchUp sketch of our basketball earth and our tennis ball moon to scale. Well, let's b back out. That big yellow circle is the diameter of the sun. In fact, it's Jupiter and Saturn also in the, in the, the other um, circles on the big yellow circle. The sun is gigantic and it's Remember that the moon is 1.3 light seconds away. Well, the, the, uh, the sun is about 500 light seconds or about eight light minutes, 8.3 light minutes from the earth. Now astronomers are lazy and rather than, than talk about 93 million miles or 149,000 kilometers, we just call that distance of the earth to the sun one AU, one astronomical unit. So we'll use that measure uh, as we talk about the rest of the solar system. So what else is out there in the solar system? Well, here's a lovely Chesley Bonestell painting of a multinational mission to the asteroids. And the first asteroid uh, that humanity ever discovered in, it was in 1801, it was the planetoid Ceres. And those little um, white patches that you see on the surface of Ceres, they look a little bit like toothpaste, are sort of like toothpaste. They're, uh, they're aqueous water uh, containing sort of mush that seems to be exuded by Ceres. And in fact, just this morning, I, I read a uh, proposal for a mission to Ceres a very, uh, with, with micro spacecraft to map the water of it. If the idea of going out and, and using resources and bringing bits back from asteroids sounds far-fetched. It's not, it's already happened two times by two different Japanese missions and it's about to happen with the US mission. Uh, this is an artist's drawing of what was called Hayabusa 2, touching down on the asteroid Bennu. There's the real asteroid. And I like how the uh, artist here depicted the shadow of the solar array of the spacecraft Here's the real shadow of the real solar array as the spacecraft was approaching the asteroid Bennu. And it hopped around on the surface. It had some little hoppers that it really 
yeast. And it drilled out a small sample, a few grams, and returned it to the earth that landed in Australia uh, last year. So, and, and that was Hayabusa 2. Hayabusa 1 brought back a, a picogram sample uh, a few years before that. And the US is in the process of bringing a sample back as well. When we think about the asteroids, uh, we tend to think of the ones that were first discovered in the belt between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter, but there are many others. And this video will show the asteroids discovered between uh, January 1st, 1999 and January 31st, 2018. So in the old days, the way we would find asteroids is that graduate students, essentially slave laborers, would, would look at photographic plates in, uh, in things called plate comparators, and they'd look for motion. But now, now we use the same kind of cameras you have in your phone. This orange area is, are the belt asteroids. But what you could see is there are thousands of asteroids inside the, the traditional asteroid belt. They're all over the place. So thanks to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory for that cool visualization. One of my friends from the uh, uh, late of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Joel Sircell, has been looking at how could we extract resources from asteroids. And he has demonstrated a really neat technique where he uses concentrated sunlight. And here you see these Mickey Mouse ears are inflatable solar concentrators. And the solar energy is essentially reflected, piped into this big baggie that has an asteroid piece in it. And it is, it is touchless mining because the energy beam, uh, which is allowed to flicker on and off, spallates the, the asteroid material, actually makes it um, expand and break off. It's kind of magical. If you remember the old Lost in Space TV series from the 60s, silly really fast, but they had a laser drill that they used for, for mining for fuel resources. Uh, well, this is that without the lasers. It turns out you don't even need lasers to do this. Right? In 1977, O'Neill in his book, The High Frontier, pointed out that with the asteroids that we knew about way back then, uh, 40 plus years ago, that just the material that we knew about at that time, and we found many more since then, that, was an, that would be enough to provide building material for space habitats with the equivalent land area of 3,000 Earths. Now, I'm not suggesting that we're going to do that anytime soon or that it's even a wonderful thing to do to make so many or expand the human population size by thousands of times. But it's interesting to know that um, the resources to sustain humanity and expand it somewhat if we want to and, and, and put it out in multiple locations so that it's unkillable uh, are clearly available to us. And in fact, just this week, something very, very interesting was announced. The discovery of an asteroid that is locked in position in the orbit, same orbit as the Earth around the sun. And what at one of the Lagrange points, Lagrange was a uh, mathematician who figured out that where you have multiple bodies in space, there are certain areas that are sort of stable as, uh, as they move. So as, this, as the Earth moves around the sun, these points, L4 and L5 in the Earth's orbit move with it. And these points, L1 and L2 also move with it. L2 in the Earth-Sun system, this is where the James Webb Telescope has just been positioned. Oops, excuse me. Uh, the asteroid that was just discovered is called um, 2020 XL5. And you could see that to see that from the Earth, you have to look in the general direction of the Sun. So that's the reason Earth-Sun Trojan asteroids are hard to see. But why do we care? We care because these could be the easiest materials to move to the vicinity of Earth, even easier in terms of energy than, than moon launching. Further away, so we might not do that right away, but in the long run, this might be the best source of, of space materials uh, for the next century.
Now, I bet it's not lost on anybody watching this when you saw those all that big rat's nest of asteroids dancing around in the JPL visualization. <clears throat> that, gee, wouldn't that be kind of a bad thing if one of those were to hit the Earth? And maybe that idea um, came up in conversation 60 million years ago. I don't know. But the good news is that the same tool set that allows you to utilize those resources uh, also allows you to protect the Earth from cosmic collisions. And we can talk about that in the questions if you'd like. I just quickly want to touch on the fact that there's a, a whole other class of objects, uh, some of which be, become pro probably become asteroids, the cores of comets that come in from deep space. And this is one of my favorite photographs of all time. It was taken by the uh, European Space Agency, who landed on this comet core. And uh, it looks as if many asteroids may be extinct comet cores. Talking about cool pictures, this is about as good a picture as you can get of the planet Jupiter with its giant red spot from the surface of the Earth. This was taken from one of the uh, observatories in the Atacama Desert in Chile. And the only way to get a better picture is to be, is to take it from a space plane. And I include it just because it's extremely pretty. Uh, the gas giants, Jupiter, Uranus, Neptune, they're not places for humanity. Uh, they're at the bottom of amazingly deep gravity wells. But especially Jupiter and Saturn are actually the nuclei of their own almost little mini solar systems. Jupiter has about 80 known moons. And I say about because every few months we find another one. When I was running the planetarium in St. Louis, we had a chalkboard. It looked like today's special, but it said how many moons in the solar system today? And we had to change it every few weeks. And Saturn has even more moons than Jupiter. So while those gas giants themselves are not interesting places for getting resources or, or, or having ease of visit, uh, the moons are. Beyond Neptune, we are finding lots and lots of new objects uh, that are characterized as something called the Kuiper Belt. And a recent British survey uh, is the result uh, or created this visualization of Kuiper Belt objects. So there's Pluto. So the, the furthest blue ring is Neptune. These are trans Neptunian objects. So it's sort of a third part of the solar system. We, we live in the inner solar system. There's sort of the middle part where the asteroids are. And then the third part out beyond Neptune. And we've seen some trans-Neptunian objects fairly close up. This is um, an object that the New Horizons probe passed after going to Pluto. It's a Katek binary, two, two chunks of matter touched with less force than uh, somebody poetically said, if, if those two snowballs uh, were cars, they wouldn't have to report it as an accident to their insurance companies. That's how, how dainty the, the contact was between them, but they stuck. And moving out even beyond the Kuiper belt, we have the, the place where comets originate, the Oort cloud, named after the Dutch astronomer who postulated its existence back in the 1950s. And if you read popular science press, you know, people breathlessly say that the Voyager space probes are now out in interstellar space. Well, they're really out past the heliopause where the solar wind is sort of an equilibrium with space around it. But the Oort cloud is, I consider it still our solar system and the Voyagers won't get to the beginning of the inside edge of the Oort cloud for about another 300 years and they won't get to the outside of the Oort cloud for another 300,000 years. And the Earth cloud is somewhat three-dimensional. It's not just the donut, but I'll pass on that. So what I want to leave you with sort of is, uh, I'm, I'm not almost to the end here, is to consider a non-planet-centric view of the solar system. This device is a planetarium. Well, classically, we could see the planets. So we cared about them. And as we thought about the solar system, we thought about the solar systems being composed of these planets. But with the exception of the Earth, 
The other ones are basically non-inhabitable and so not particularly interesting from a practical standpoint. They're certainly interesting from a scientific standpoint, but in terms of doing useful things there, not so much. So the, the interesting solar system is sort of the opposite. There's something called in, in drawing like negative space drawings. So instead of drawing the object, you draw the area around it. Well, the real interesting solar system is a negative image of the, of the planets in the planetarium. And I submit to you that a spacefarer's map of the useful solar system, is something like the equivalent of a dolphin's map of the world. We really don't know how dolphins think, uh, but you could guess that if they were to make a map, what they would care about would be the places they could live. So the oceans, and they'd be especially interested in the coastal areas, the shallows where the food is good and, and uh, you can meet other dolphins. Well, uh, the parts that would be uninteresting to them would be the continental land masses. Maybe they'd make forays up the Amazon River a little bit, but besides that, not so much. So uh, when we look out into space, we've been focusing on the non-useful land masses, at least non-useful to, to spacefarers. Planets are the least accept, accessible destinations in the solar system. Uh, but by contrast, there are a lot of accessible resources and we can use those resources to make artifacts that benefit the earth and allow people to expand human civilization. And the solar system is vastly bigger than what we learned or what we even knew about as little as, as a few decades ago. So let's kill a few more myths. One of the things that, that, uh, that we find especially in treaty law about space treaties is they were modeled after the treaties that have to do with places like Antarctica, which are relatively small, finite, non-useful. And they're also in the biosphere of the earth. So making the, the thing that lawyers tend to do uh, is to you know, pick examples that are close fits and apply them. And at the time when these treaties were made in the 60s, Antarctica looked like a close fit, but it's almost the opposite of that. Another myth I'd like to kill off is the notion that the reason that people like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos are interested in space is they want to have a plan B for when folks screw up the Earth and its biosphere, a place else that they can go. And it's almost exactly the opposite of that. Jeff Bezos has said the reason we're doing space is not because of, of a plan B, it's to make sure that plan A works. It's to, it's to preserve and repair the Earth. Now in the 60s, when we had our first big foray into space during the so-called space race, the rationale was simple and could be stated in four words in America, to beat the Russians. This was the, the sort of feeling at the time. And the Russians had the exact same mirror image, raison d'etre for space. But let me give you some alternative real objectives for space. The most important one is to preserve the only known biosphere that we see. We look out in the, into the cosmos and we see trillions of stars. And now we've found thousands of planets around some of those stars, but we have not found any other biospheres. And it is imperative that we protect this one. We can do that in part by extending civilization's economic sphere out into the cosmos so that we can get energy. And if we wanted even material resources, things like the platinum group metals that can um, help us get clean energy, combat climate change, have less polluting transportation fuels that we make from recycled carbon from the atmosphere. Having, having platinum group metals helps that a lot as catalysts. But we can do that and we can expand humanity's ecological niche. Those of you that are familiar with Frank Drake and the, uh, <clears throat> the idea of SETI, search for extraterrestrial intelligence, will know that Frank said the most important component of his famous equation about the probability of finding other civilizations is the average lifetime of technological civilizations. And he has said that, that he, he thinks, the, the reason he thinks SETI will happen is that advanced civilizations or advancing civilizations 
will expand their ecological niches th through their whole solar systems, doing what O'Neill has proposed with space habitats. And they'll talk to each other and that energy from that from those communications will spill out and will detect it with SETI. Space equals abundance of material and energy, and that gives humanity better choices. <clears throat> and when you have more choice and more room to live, you have more freedom. <clears throat> and those three things together equal hope. And that's the, the real reason for doing space. So people who say, oh, we shouldn't do space until we fix every single problem on earth are, are operating on the old models. In fact, we should do everything we can do to give ourselves the potential to fix the problems. And one way to do it is to outflank them by using the energy and material resources of the vast ocean of space that surrounds our little island earth. I recently discovered this 18th or 19th century British poet, Christina Rossetti, and I think she said it perfectly. She said, tread softly, all the earth is holy ground. It may be, could we look with seeing eyes, this spot we stand on is a paradise. Well, we have to protect this paradise. It is the, the most important bit of work we have in the 21st century, not just against our own folly of things like nuclear war, but against the consequences of, of raising people out of poverty with energy, uh, we've got to be able to do that. To do that, we have to do it with, with zero carbon energy. And we also have to protect ourselves from, from cosmic tragedy. And, and, and as we now know, impacts happen, continue to happen uh, in the solar system. So we just have been lucky so far. So we could protect the earth from some of the biggest pressing existential threats, both man-made and, and not man-made, if we continue our quest in the cosmos. I'm gonna skip in the interest of time a discussion of how St. Louis has been deeply involved in this, other than to say that following the pattern of, of, of um, Charles Lindbergh, who changed the way everybody thought about flying, a group of us started something called the X Prize, uh, Lindbergh was pursuing the Orphan Prize for the first nonstop flight between New York and Paris. We offered a prize of $10 million for the first private human space flight. It was won in 2004 by a team uh, funded by Paul Allen. And in fact, if you look very closely at the spaceship, you could see the St. Louis Science Center logo on the side. and the new spirit of St. Louis logo. People in St. Louis were instrumental in helping this come to pass. It's the reason I live in St. Louis. I moved here to work on that. And in fact, this shows, uh, there's the Science Center and uh, Peter Diamandis, Bob Weiss, and I are giving a big check of $10 million to the winners. Bert Rutan, who designed the spacecraft, and Paul Allen, who funded it. And in the only piece of poetic justice I've seen in my career, Hanging next to the Spirit of St. Louis that inspired us is the vehicle that won the X Prize Spaceship One in the Smithsonian. And that's kicked off. Um, Branson bought the company that won. Um, Bezos, who read Gerard O'Neill's books when he was in high school, uh, has started Blue Origin and has had the first uh, paid human flights to space, to suborbital space. And Branson's folks are, are, they go right to the edge of space. And <clears throat> doing that caused NASA to have the confidence to give contracts to Elon Musk and one other commercial company. And SpaceX is the first company in history to make space flight less expensive than it was before. So it, it's driving this revolutionary change. It's not just the, the idea of the things we can do in space, but it's also who can do those revolutionary things that's changed utterly in the last 10 years, including commercial activity at the moon. So I want to encourage you to read some of these books and there uh, you can find, and Bob, I'll let you talk about how people can find that bibliography of resources, including videos and books that you can look at and read to further your knowledge of this amazing subject. 
Thank you very much. I really apologize for the power outage. I wish I had some wireless power going on when I was busily rigging up a backup um, when the power cut. Uh, I'd love to take your questions and I encourage you to stay out of gravity wells. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Greg. Uh, we definitely uh, appreciate your time and uh, thank you uh, to you and to our audience for bearing with us through the, uh, the technical issues, the power outage, all that stuff. Um, but yeah, we do have some great questions here. Uh, the first two are, are along the sim similar vein from Linda and from Phil. Uh, they both have to do with space junk. Uh, Phil writes, National Geographic magazine celebrated the moon landing and included an article optimistically foreshadowing our presence on Mars by 1980. If we interpret Max Planck's assertion that science moves forward mm -hmm. in a Darwinian fashion, Humans tend to prepare based upon our last major disaster, and it seems everything promised takes much longer than we expect. What is being done proactively regarding space junk? What will ensure safe high-speed movement back and forth from our pale blue dot to free space? And Linda, on a similar note, asked, how do we control the future space junk and all the satellites and other objects or weapons orbiting in space? Well, I'm glad you asked. It's a, it's a very interesting question. The, um, there's not presently any material regulation that requires people like these constellation operators, folks like, like Starlink, which is Elon Musk's um, constellation satellite telecommunications company, or uh, or any of the other proposed constellations, the, the requirements are mostly written around preventing interference with each other's frequency uses. Uh, that needs to probably change, and there's a lot of interest in doing it. In fact, the XPRIZE Foundation is currently looking at the possibility of offering prizes or bounties for, or other methods of creating inducements we really need to build a system where people aren't allowed to, to, to not clean up after themselves. And actually the worst two uh, occurrences of space debris are not the result of just normal space operations. They're the result of, uh, I'll editorialize, ridiculous uh, posturing, military posturing in space by primarily by China and Russia. There were two, in the, two different ASAT anti-satellite tests uh, account for almost all the growth in space debris in the last decade. So, and the, and the most recent one by Russia has caused satellites and, and space station to actually have to be moved around a little bit to, to lower the probability of impact. The probability of impact is still really low. If you look at any, any of the altitudes in space where there are satellites, the, the actual amount of it's like sort of giant superhighways with a handful of cars in them. Uh, if, you, if you took all the cars in the world and, and put them into one graphic, it looks like a real rat's nest. It's not quite. But we can see that it will, be, it will get worse if we don't do something about it. So this is one of the areas where treaty law hasn't kept up. And I think we need ev even things that are less than treaties, moral suasion. We need a, a accords between folks that agree and they, they say, we're, we're not going to do ASAT tests. And uh, that's what I would like to see happen right now. And there's no reason it couldn't happen right now. But beyond that, I'd like to see, I'd like to see requirements for constellation operators that they have to promise to uh, deorbit their low Earth orbit constellations when they're done, when, they, when the satellites reach end of life. And as a condition of getting a launch license, I'd like to see them have to even pre-clean the areas where they want to go so they could remove the existing debris uh, as sort of a tax on doing business in space for them. And that would, they, it would benefit them too and reduce their insurance premiums because it would reduce the probability of impact. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Michael asked, has the creation of the new Space Force Agency driven more funding and scientists in some total toward the greater exploration of space travel and the future progress in this regard? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, 
I don't know that it has done that. There has been, there have been a lot of good things that have come out of uh, um, DOD type operations in space. The best one, of course, that we all enjoy every day almost. In fact, maybe today's an example of a day we're not using it, but GPS. So I was involved with, with uh, the analysis of, of whether we should provide better GPS data to civilians. Uh, uh, back in the mid 1990s, President Clinton asked James Schlesinger uh, to analyze that. And I was part of his tiny little team that looked at it. And that's massive, massively beneficial. Uh, and started from military requirements. So the military's general job is just to make sure that that stuff is protected, that, that the status quo doesn't get badly changed by somebody who disrupts things for evil intent. And, and I would imagine there's probably some money that's being spent by the the Space Force. The Space Force is basically um, just, its they're not really doing anything particularly new that I'm aware of. They're doing what other parts of DOD had been doing. They just now have a different uh, postal address and a different organizational chart. So there's some good, but it's not a radical change. All right. Uh, emerging tech in food like vertical farming and alternative proteins originated with NASA and the European Space Agency. With especially the ag, plant, and food science strength in St. Louis, what kinds of activities in agriculture, food production, processing, and research would be especially suited for free space? Well, the, one of the, uh, O'Neill and I, um, so I ran O'Neill's Institute at Princeton. I left Chicago in 1985. I had joined his institute as a director in 1980. And Jerry passed away in, in 1992. When we, in the last years of, of his life, we spent a lot of time looking at what are the requirements for a true space habitat versus a temporary space station. And we came up with three, three criteria. Uh, <clears throat> one is that you have enough radiation shielding that you can stay there as long as you want and have normal, the children can live there and, and have normal development because kids are especially susceptible to, to radiation disruption of their chromosomes. Uh, two was they have enough, there's enough gravity level inside. And as I said, we don't really know what that is yet, but there's enough gravity level in a habitat that you can live there as long as you want and go back and forth to earth, send your kids to school on earth if you want. There's, you have normal human development. And the third one is sufficient closed, life, closed cycle life support. And that's where this question is interesting because uh, there are a lot of ways to, um, uh, and we've demonstrated a lot of ways to grow plants and to a lesser extent sustain animals in a, in, in a closed cycle life su support system. But it, it's, a, it's a really interesting and fun challenge, and it may hold the key to uh, the next green revolution. Uh, St. Louis is in a good position. I have had the, the pleasure and privilege of visiting some of the leading edge facilities here in St. Louis, where, where some of the, uh, where I see some of that work may hold keys to what pieces of the biosphere do you need to take in the early phases of space exploration so that you can have reasonable closed cycle systems. In the long run, you can have really large systems which have really diverse biospheres. The, the challenge, and it's the challenge for things like vertical farming is how do you get the essential parts uh, when you're not trying to do everything in the, in, in the whole pan panoply of nature, but just the parts you care about. And one of the big challenges up till now has been energy for vertical farming. The biggest change in that of all things is, is actually the, where the light comes from. Uh, light emitting diodes uh, are super efficient. So some of those kinds of questions about what light frequencies do plants need that particularly help them to grow. Um, uh, it, it'll be a symbiosis. I think we'll have things that will make it easier for space pioneers to, to 
achieve early close cycle life support. And I think some of the things that will be learned from those pioneers who, who have to do that or else perish will uh, be of benefit to folks on the earth. All right, I think we've got time for a couple more questions if you, if you have time for it. Uh, I certainly do. Okay, so Nicholas asks, um, the ISS is protected from ionizing radiation due to the Earth's magnetic field. <clears throat> What solutions are in development for shielding from ionizing radiation on space installations? So it, it turns out that's basically just a physical uh, issue of shielding, shielding mass. So in, when you look at NASA's plans to go to Mars, and, and I'm, I'm a critic of, of most of them, one of the areas I'm most critical at is they don't provide enough protection for the astronauts who are going to be spending an awfully long time in transit back and forth. Um, and the astronauts as a group are sort of like uh, athletes who say, hey, put me in coach. We don't, you know, we don't care. I mean, they essentially are saying, we don't care if we're exposed to radiation that's gonna triple our chances of dying of cancer, um, but I care. And, and if you're talking about space habitats and families and such, you care. So, uh, it's actually a simple problem of enough shielding mass. And it turns out about a meter of moon soil is enough to, to block everything that, that you need. The, the problem is when you think about, about what a cubic meter weighs, if you have to launch that from the earth, and it's not like NASA's crazy or anything, they just, it's not in their budget to do it. So if they're going to do Mars, and I think we should go visit for scientific reasons, if we're going to do that with people, the way to do it is to, first get the use of space resources so that having a, a suitable radiation shielding shell is not prohibitively expensive. And you can use water and such, it just takes a little more of it. So uh, yeah, the, uh, people have also talked about active shielding, like have a big magnetic field for space habitats in the future. Uh, and, and that's not um, implausible, but it doesn't have to be complicated. You can just do it with, with uh, lots of dirt and sand. Well, on a similar note, uh, along the same lines of uh, radiation, uh, David was wondering, what is the energy density of that 30 kilowatt beam and does it present a radiation hazard? So uh, the, the the reason for the design of those big solar power satellites in Earth orbit is to have a fairly diffuse beam that's very efficiently converted to electricity on the ground. So the, the collection efficiency of that beam is really good. Um, in, in 1975, it was about 82%. That means that 82% of the radio beam that hit the antenna came out as usable DC power, which is, which is really good. I mean, especially compared to a solar cell where typically commercially they're about 10%. Uh, the beam is purposely made diffuse so that the, uh, you could fly through it in an airplane and not have problems. People wouldn't suffer any ill effects from it. Birds wouldn't suffer ill effects from it. But you, you wouldn't want to camp out at the center of the, um, of the rectenna. Uh, you could go under the rectenna and uh, you could plant crops there. Crops don't mind uh, getting this, but it, it's, not, it's not ionizing radiation. It's not nuclear radiation. It's, it's like heat or light. It's, it's that kind of frequency. In fact, the typical frequency that's proposed is 2.4. Gigawatt, uh, uh, gigahertz. So it's, it's radio frequency. So we have radio frequency running around us all the time. It, it is that. It is not ionizing radiation. It's not nuclear radiation. It's not gamma rays, beta rays, or that kind of stuff. Okay. Michael was wondering, is the United States Space Agency, is NASA, working with the international community on the likely destructive impact of the asteroid Apophis on into the Earth in some years, uh, and its deflection, or is that something known or considered by NASA or other space scientists or agencies? So, in in the uh, um, 
It's a really interesting story in general. The, the, the short answer is yes. The, the, the longer answer is that since the 90s, we have realized, and I say we, we as a nation, the United States has realized that, and in fact, the world has realized that the chance of cosmic collision is a real thing. It was generally kind of believed that all the collisions that were going to happen in the solar system had happened eons ago. And after we got back from, it, it's hard to believe almost, but, but uh, I was a teenager, I was 15 when, when uh, Neil and Buzz landed on the moon. And, and when they did, scientists were roughly equally divided about whether the moon's craters were caused by impacts or volcanoes. As soon as those first moon rocks came back, we knew that they were mainly caused by impacts. So it took a while for that, the implication of that to sink in. People said, wow, well, if the moon has been pulverized by so many impacts over time, uh, and it's tiny, it, it's 25% you know, the diameter of the earth and 181st of the mass of the earth, the earth must have been hit a lot more than the moon. And of course it has, but we normally don't see the effects because of weathering and we have oceans over you know, large pieces of the earth. So uh, it's about the same time as, as uh, uh, Alvarez uh, discovered the iridium layer all around every place of the earth that corresponds with the, the uh, KT boundary where the dinosaurs died and posited the theory that a big asteroid impact on the earth had, had been the cause of that. And then in 1997, we saw for the first time an actual set of collisions that we could observe. And it was, it was the comet Schumacher-Levy. Uh, uh, Madam Schumacher just passed away just in the last year. And she was the wife of Jean Schumacher, who was a famous geologist as well. And she and, and Levy, who was a, a uh, amateur astronomer, co-discovered the that a comet. And bits of that comet uh, struck Jupiter, and we saw it. And it was pretty spectacular. And the result of that was the creation of two groups in the United States by the government. Group one was, how do we detect possible killer asteroids and comets? And group two was, what do we do if we do detect one that, that is likely in the future to hit? And I was part of group two. So um, actually I was in the earlier part of the nineties. So uh, there are plans, uh, plans is too strong a word. There are studies of what you can do. Uh, and, and, and the punchline here is basically, you can do many more things. You have lots more options that are promising about deflecting, preventing an impact if you, you have time. So if you have a comet that comes screaming in and you can't see it until six months before it's gonna hit, there's not a lot you can do about it. Uh, but if you've got an asteroid that's making close passes and you know that it's gonna come by in 40 or 50 years, there are things you can do. And as we speak, there's a mission that's going out and it's going to impact an asteroid with a, with a small, relatively small, uh, rocket stage and see what kind of a shove it gives it. Um, it, it. It's not true that the thing you do is like the movie Armageddon, go take a bomb and, and implant it in the asteroid and blow it up because what you might wind up with instead of one thing coming at you is a whole bunch of smaller things coming at you that you can't, you can't easily do. So you, th th there's a lot we could talk about, about, about it, but the, there, there's not, none of these have ridden, risen to the level of detailed mission planning for what to do about Apophis, but, uh, but the underlying research of, uh, along these lines is absolutely going on as we speak. Well, we have one more question for you, and that's from Linda. She wants to know, what are the theories about how we might save our Earth given the climate problems and our propensity to, to pollute it? Well, the... the the climate problem is based on changes that humans have made to the atmosphere's ability to pass certain frequencies of radiation. So sin, uh, uh, 
the beginning, what we call the Industrial Revolution is actually a second order uh, phenomenon. There was a first order phenomenon, which is humans learned to unlock the stored solar energy uh, contained in, by, uh, by biology in, in matter that became coal and oil and, and, uh, and, and becomes wood and such. And so when we, every time we burn material, we are unleashing CO2. And that CO2 is what changes the transmissibility of certain frequencies. So what's happening is, is uh, that what we're seeing in climate change now is an unprecedented amount of man-made change to, to the atmosphere. So what we need to do first is not do that anymore. Now that's the biggest hurdle. The, it's not like people want to pollute the atmosphere, but what they do want to do is survive winter. So uh, the easiest way to do that is to, is to, you know, is to burn stuff. And I'm, I'm sorry to have to tell you that today in the 21% of the 22% now of the way through the 21st century, the percentage of energy that uh, of the world's energy use that comes from burning stuff is about 80%. In fact, I encourage you to read Daniel Yergin, Y-E-R-G-I-N, his book, The New Map, came out about two years ago. It's sort of the best overall compendium of energy stuff today. Uh, we've got to stop doing that. That's the reason I'm very interested in space solar power because we certainly should use solar on the ground and, and wind and, and geothermal, everything we can use, uh, that is sustainable. The problem is storage and, and networking of, of these things and the general amount of energy density on the surface of the planet. And when you have things like industries that support human civilization and cities, most people, uh, about 10 years ago, we passed the boundary where more people now live in cities than don't live in cities. And about 20 years from now, more people will live in super giant megacities than don't live in super giant megacities. So those places have super high energy density requirements and space solar power is really well um, positioned uh, by its characteristics to be able to, to fill the needs of people that live in those high energy density places. But uh, we've, the problem is it takes typically, if you look historically, it takes about hundred years to switch from one energy source to another. So we have got to really accelerate our progress if we're going to have a hope of, of getting around the problem. And in fact, people are now starting to very seriously consider what's called geoengineering, which is where you, where you do things like put more sulfur in the atmosphere on purpose to, to try to block sunlight. And uh, there's a couple of science fiction books about that subject out right now. Uh, Neil Stevenson's book, um, shoot, what's it called? Termination Shock uh, uh, has just come out. And uh, Kim Stanley Robinson, who, uh, who wrote the Mars books, which suggest that people will terraform Mars. He now says, well, that's just a plot device. Um, his book, Ministry of the Future or Ministry for the Future, uh, has just come out. These are about the impacts of geoengineering on, on this problem. We, I would hate for us to be forced to have to do geoengineering to survive the climate crisis. I'd rather we solve the underlying uh, part, which is mainly about energy. All right. Well, thank you very much for that. And that's all the questions we have, and that's all the questions we have time for. So that worked out perfectly. Uh, so Greg, I would like to thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedule to share your insights with us this afternoon. And I'd also like to thank you, our audience for joining us and for all of your great questions. And the recording of this presentation will be available on the UMSL Global YouTube channel. Please plan on joining us for the next Great Decisions event in two weeks on February 17th, when we will discuss Latin American drug policy with Dr. Tom Hare from the Pulte Institute for Global Development at the University of Notre Dame. And you, uh, you can sign up for our email list at <clears throat> global.umsl.edu uh, to learn about all these events and, uh, and more. But again, thank you.